claims his identity. And because he remained true to that fundamental identity, he practiced, Gandhi says, perfect nonviolent resistance to death. So I get two scripture texts that you all know we've been talking about them, for this foundation of our spirituality. We've heard them a million times. Blessed are the peacemakers, they are the sons and daughters of God. This is what I mean. This is what's happened to me. The empire is always telling us who we are. You're nobody. But if you want to be somebody, buy this or vote this way. Name in the United States, the TV commercial for the forces of death said, you want to be all you can be? Join the Marines and kill for the empire. That's the slogan in New Mexico with the greatest recruitment for the army among the poor. That's what they're told. They're telling us who, are, who we are. Jesus comes along and says, no, you are the beloved sons and daughters of the God of peace, not the sons and daughters of empire. And we don't like that. We say, oh, no, I couldn't do that. That's a false humility. But I think if you're going to practice an authentic spirituality of resistance, you have to claim this. That's what I'm trying. That's what you're all doing. Our core identity and our calling is to be faithful to the fundamental identity of ourselves. You are the beloved daughters of the God of peace, the beloved sons of the God of peace. If we can be faithful to that, then of course we go forth and resist empire and make peace. We're just chips off the old block. You don't like that? Okay, he comes along and says, love your enemies and pray for your persecutors as we study that. Fantastic. I read Dr. King, and I'm paraphrasing him, and in his great sermon on this text, he says, why? Okay, Jesus, maybe, but why? And Dr. King says, Jesus doesn't say, love your enemies because it's the right thing to do, even though it is. Jesus doesn't say, love your enemies because it's the moral, philosophical position to take, even though it is. And he doesn't say, which he should, love your enemies because it's the only practical political solution left for you all, <laughs> even though it is. Dr. King says, what does he say? Love your enemies. Then you, didn't we just agree? You will be the beloved sons and daughters of the God who lets the sun shine and the good and the bad and the rain fall on the just and the unjust. Wow! In this most political statement in the Bible, we, I think we get the best description of the nature of divinity. You are the sons and daughters of a God of universal nonviolent love, and so you go forth and, and practice that and do the same. It's just fantastic. Uh, that's why I think you could define nonviolence as remembering who you are. And violence as forgetting who you are. And it all begins there. And the, the implications socially, economically, politically, every human being on the planet is your beloved sister and brother. I just am trying to say, I'm talking about spirituality, uh, to reclaim your identity. I found that very important in my journey, and to be faithful to it, and not to let the empire <laughs> tell me who I am. Uh, and, and, and then maybe we can be like Jesus and go all the way. And not violence. Now, I'm, I'm looking at you all and you're going, this guy's had too much coffee. <laughs> this is not where, hey, if you don't like this, uh, you know, another thing we could talk about is St. Paul with a great line about, we are citizens of the reign of God. And unpacking that, we're no longer citizens of the empire. Our allegiance, for me, no, my allegiance is not to America. I highly recommend prison as bringing clarity to New York. <laughs> anyway, you know what I mean. Four, the spirituality of nonviolent resistance means we are contemplatives of peace and nonviolence. People who spend time every day with the God of peace, who live in intimate relationship with the God of peace, to dwell in that fundamental identity as God's beloved sons and daughters. So we resist empire on the one hand, but on the positive other hand, we live in relationship with the God of peace. And I urge us all, which we're all trying to do, to spend time every day with the God of peace in silent prayer contemplation, meditation. The Jesuits always recommend 30 minutes a day. The reason we don't like to do this, at least in the empire, is because all the roots of violence and war and empire within us start coming up, bubbling up. We don't like that. And that's the point of prayer, it seems to me, to allow God to disarm our hearts of the roots of empire and war within us. 
So there are many ways we can talk about prayer and meditation and spirituality and many resources. And Chad was teaching us about the importance of Bible study, uh, you know, to as Catholics, the sacraments. And there's all the wonderful traditions we have. But I just urge us in this journey to sustain us for the long haul, to be with God, to let the God of peace love us, and to let Jesus give us his resurrection gift of peace, to welcome it. And in that safe place, your check-in time with God, you could say. I invite us to keep letting go of our imperial tendencies, our inner violence, our hatred, our anger, resentments, bitterness, or desire for vengeance, whatever the roots of empire and war and violence and occupation are within us, to give it to the God of peace, to grant clemency, amnesty, and forgiveness to everyone who ever hurt you, and to move from anger and violence to nonviolence and compassion within, to welcome God's inner gift of peace, so we can radiate personally the peace we seek politically, so that our very presence is disarming, so that from now on we're practicing a new kind of holiness that is a threat to empire. We're talking about a dangerous mysticism, and this is what Gandhi and King achieved and what our Palestinian sisters and brothers are doing. And the amazing thing is, as we do this, we really spend formal time with this God of peace, as we're resisting empire, we're talking about the politics of prayer, if you will, you find out that contrary to what <clears throat> the empire, the Pentagon, says about God, which is always, it's always talking about God, to my mind, God is not a God of war and empire. God is a God of love and compassion and peace and nonviolence. And Gandhi says if we can begin to imagine the peace and nonviolence of God, we will begin to worship a God of peace and love and nonviolence, and then we become people of peace and love and nonviolence. I'm just saying, urging us to dwell in the peace of God, especially as we go home to reflect on all of this. And that means to listen to what God says. And what I find that as you do this, God is always trying to say a word of encouragement. So I'll give you one example if you're still here with me. What was the spirituality of resistance of Dr. King? And Chen taught us about Dr. King. Uh, he had no experience of God, you could argue, given the Christian tradition, except for once. He wrote about it in his first book, January 25th, I think, 1956, midnight. He's 25 years old, two months into the Montgomery boycott, constant death threats, the whole country's exploding over this, Rosa Parks sits at it, it's midnight, Coretta's asleep, the phone rings, this horrible guy starts attacking him, calling every name in the book, and says, You're, we're going to bomb your house and kill you and Coretta and your baby. And that's it. 25-year-old Dr. King gave up kitchen of the rectory, uh, behind, a couple blocks behind the Dexter Avenue Church, put a big pot of coffee on, sat down at the kitchen table, put his head down and said, God, I give up. I try. But you've done something to me, and now they're kill they want to kill me, they're attacking me, I wanted to be a nice minister, but Coretta's life, I, I can't take it anymore. I, I, I try, I give up. He said he heard an inner voice. Martin Luther King, Stand up for justice. Martin Luther King, stand up for equality. Martin Luther King, stand up and speak out for peace. And I promise, I will never leave you alone. Never alone. No, never alone. No, never alone. And he told this story about 10 or 20 times a year. He gave a speech every day. Up till the week he died. And I have tapes of it. And he starts going on and on. You know, never alone. Never alone, like he's drifting off. And the church teaches that uh, when God speaks to the charismatic prophet of our people, he, God is speaking to all of us. I, I want to take that word to heart. How is God saying that to you? Listen to that word of, of encouragement. I'm always with you in the struggle. That's for all of us. Oh, I'd love to talk about the power of intercessory prayer, praying daily for an end to the occupation and the wars. We could talk about the instruction of the Sermon on the Mount to pray for our persecutors. It's a teaching on prayer in the Sermon on the Mount, which means to pray for the great war makers of the planet. I'm just going to name them. Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton and the settlers and all the people and so forth and so on. 